Hi and welcome to To The Point. My name's Birgit Whelan and it's really lovely to be back with you for another programme. And we have a special programme planned for you today. We're carrying on with a series on the miracles of Jesus and the Gospel accounts. And what we're trying to do is work through these in the order that they appear in the Gospel accounts. So today we're up to the third miracle that is recorded um, of Jesus performing. And that is Jesus healing Simon Peter's mother-in-law of a fever. And it's an amazing account where we see physical illness subject to the authority that Jesus has. And we're really hoping that the program will be an encouragement to you, particularly if you yourself are in need of healing or you have a loved one who needs healing, just that we have a God who is able to heal us. Um, so we're going to be discussing this passage, discussing the miracle, and also we have um, something so inspiring at the end, which is a very short testimony of a guest that we previously interviewed who actually encountered Jesus Christ. And um, he was actually healed of bowel cancer whilst also on chemotherapy. It's an amazing and inspiring story that we're going to include at the very end of the program. So lots in store for you today. Um, and joining me to discuss this amazing miracle is our friend, Dr. Richard Kent. Richard, <laughs> <laughs> welcome. Thanks for asking me. <laughs> so Richard, what were your thoughts about, just initially, what were your thoughts about this miracle as you as you read and prepared for it today? Oh, well, it's wonderful. Well, it's, we're going to be, read the particular one in Mark. Yes. And in Mark, everything happens immediately, instantly, doesn't it? <laughs> because Mark is like an express train, isn't it? Yeah. And uh, as soon as, uh, Je- we're going to read it in a minute, but as soon as uh, Jesus comes from the synagogue, instantly or immediately, he heals uh, this poor mother-in-law. <laughs> we'll be talking about that, but it's just, um, Jesus doesn't seem to hang around. He's just <laughs> straight there and heals people. <laughs> well, actually, Richard, you could maybe set the scene for us by reading us the passage in Mark, yes. um, just describing what Jesus actually did and describing this miracle. So are you able to read that for us if it comes up yes, on screen? Yes, that'd be great. That's Brilliant. Do put it on the screen, that'd be great. So actually, uh, it's in uh, Mark, chapter one, starting at verse 29. Now, as soon as they had come out of the synagogue, they entered the house of Simon and Andrew with James and John. But Simon's wife's mother lay sick with a fever, and they told him about her at once. So he came and took her by the hand and lifted her up, and immediately the fever left her, and she served them. At evening, when the sun had set, they brought to him all who were sick and those who were demon-possessed. And the whole city were gathered together at the door. Then he healed many who were sick with various diseases and cast out many demons, and he did not allow the demons to speak because they knew him. Well, that is wonderful, Richard. And as we can see, I mean, it's a very short passage, but it's Mm. very dense. It includes so much of of Jesus having such compassion, not only on Simon Peter's mother-in-law, but in the way that he healed many. Um, We're going to return and and look at this verse by verse. But what we also have is an animated version of a complementary account of this story. Um, And it's the version that Luke writes about. Um, We have a a short video clip of that just to complement the story that we've just read. So we'll go to that now. I'll be back with you in a few moments. After Jesus left the synagogue, he entered Simon's house. Now Simon's mother-in-law was suffering from a high fever, and they asked Jesus to help her. So he stood over her, commanded the fever, and it left her. Immediately, she got up and began to serve them. As the sun was setting, All those who had any relatives sick with various diseases brought them to Jesus. He placed his hands on every one of them and healed them. Demons also came out of many, crying out, You are the Son of God! But he rebuked them and would not allow them to speak because they knew that he was the Christ. The next morning Jesus departed and went to a deserted place. Yet the crowds were seeking him And they came to him and tried to keep him from leaving them. But Jesus said to them, I must proclaim the good news of the kingdom of God to the other towns too, for that is what I was sent to do. 
just amazing to see the authority that Jesus has over illness, over demonic influence, um, and that the people needed him so much that they desired him to stay with them, but he had to, to move on and to proclaim the gospel and to do more miracles in other places, but an amazing visual representation of that. I love these accounts, Richard. I do. Yeah. <laughs> I agree with you. I love them. <laughs> so we're going to start basically at the beginning of these verses and just discuss um, everything about this passage, basically the setting and the mm. lead up and, and the miracle itself. And I know that you actually have done a little bit of research into the geographical setting where the story yeah. takes place, which is in Capernaum. And you even have some pictures that you're going to show us. So yes. it's wonderful to hear about it. <laughs> okay. yeah. Well, if we could see that first picture of Capernaum, there we are. So you can just see that's uh, just a, an image of what Capernaum would have looked like in the time of Jesus. So if you come back to me. Um, now, if you go to the Sea of Galilee, which is, by the way, my favorite place on planet Earth, it's the most beautiful, peaceful, wonderful place. And there aren't very many people there. There are quite a lot of tourists, but no, not many people living there. Actually, at the time of Jesus, there were about 500,000 people living in Israel, and most of them lived around the Sea of Galilee. It was actually a very, very busy place. Why? Because that's where the industry was. Um, the industry, uh, basically, was fishing. That was the main industry in Israel at that time. And Capernaum actually means um, the town of Nahum. Uh, Nahum, the Old Testament minor prophet. So um, people started living there about 200 years before Jesus appeared on earth. Um, and it was actually quite a big town, and an awful lot of people lived there. And the main industry, as I say, was fishing. Now, nowadays, nowadays I mean, I don't know what your impressions of fishing are, but we tend to think of uh, maybe some of the disciples of Jesus as being um, guys with little rowing boats and going out and doing a bit of fishing. Actually, it wasn't like that at all. This was fishing on an industrial scale, because most people in Israel ate bread, and fish, and that was their staple diet. Uh, in order to feed all these people, uh, there were professional fishermen uh, who caught an awful lot of fish. And of course, there was a lot of buying and selling of fish going on. And of course, that's why Matthew was there, the tax collector. He was there because um, everything had to be taxed, because uh, the Romans were, were in power and everything had to be taxed. So that's just a little bit about Capernaum. And now we can look at the next slide if we can, which I think is the Senate. Now that actually, of course, if you, um, if you come on a Revelation TV tour or any other tour of Israel, you'll go to, go to this site. Now that actually is in the, in the foreground there is the synagogue. And, in the, and if you just go back to the picture just again, sorry, if you just go back again, uh, you can see it in the back is actually, they built a, a modern church over where Peter's house was. And they're almost certain that actually it was Peter's house. So let's just talk a little bit about that. Um, first of all, the synagogue. We know we're told elsewhere in the scripture that synagogue was actually built by a Roman centurion. Uh, it was built on the highest plate part of Capernaum. And if you were in the synagogue and looking um, and, and, and if you were sitting down in the synagogue, you'll be facing towards Jerusalem. So this was a place of worship. And Jesus actually spoke there early, just before this. He actually um, uh, cast a demon out of somebody in this particular synagogue. Um, but it was actually very close to the house of Peter. Now, um, the house of Peter actually wasn't just a small little dwelling. It was actually a large house, um, more like a large bed and breakfast. Um, it actually had several outbuildings. We're told later it became a house church after, after the resurrection of Jesus and later on became a church. Uh, from after about 200 years after the death of Christ, it actually became a church. And there's actually a church there now. Um, in the excavations of, uh, the, of the house of Peter, um, they found all sorts of Christian artifacts um, and uh, uh, script, scriptures and Jesus described in four different languages and it's definitely the, uh, the house in which Peter actually lived. So there we are, a little bit of background on Capernaum and Peter. That is, it's so helpful just to have um, 
that kind of the scene set for us in that kind of way to kind of visually understand hmm. the setting that they were in. And um, some reading that I that I did for this explained that they probably were at the synagogue having an afternoon meal on the Sabbath, and it was then that they heard about Simon Peter's mother-in-law suffering in this way. So they obviously went to to the home that you've been describing, hmm. and it, it's really interesting to me actually because the different authors of the Gospels present the story in slightly different ways and Luke who is a physician um, is the only one who describes the fever as a high fever yeah. and it's not actually just a description it's an actual diagnosis and yeah. the, the actual word for it and if I pronounce this correctly is Eshatha Tsumurta and it means wow. burning fever wow. so it's actually an actual diagnosis that, his, that Simon Peter's mother-in-law was suffering from and actually the Jewish Talmud prescribes um, a remedy for this um, and it's actually quite technical. It's very interesting. I would love to learn more about it. But yeah. it involved, I think it was um, a knife made of iron, which was then tied to um, a thorn bush by um, a braid of hair. Oh. And then over four days, verses were read from Exodus 3 um, at the scene. And on the fourth day, the bush was to be cut down. And at that point, a formula should be pronounced for the for a healing remedy. But oh. it's interesting that Jesus himself, um, in this instance, didn't, didn't go along with that. He basically had authority in the situation over mm. the fever itself. And and Luke describes how he stood over Simon Peter's mother-in-law and he rebuked the fever and it instantly departed from her. She was instantly healed yes. and um, she she rose up and not only was she instantly healed, but her mm. energy levels were restored. There was no, pro no um, process of recuperation that she had to go mm. through. Her mm. energy levels were restored mm. um, and she was even able to, to begin serving. Yes. Um, amazing. It, it is, it, it's an amazing thing, but it really did demonstrates that Jesus has authority over all spheres of human suffering and human experience and yeah. that all illness is actually subject to him ultimately. Yes. But I know, Richard, from your study, you were focusing a little bit more on Mark's account, and it, it, it's a slightly different portrayal of what happened. I wonder if you could just share what you discovered as you were studying. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's quite interesting, actually, Birgit. I'll just look at the viewers, actually. Yeah. Um, it, in, in the account we just read, it says that Jesus raised... Um, Peter's mother-in-law by her hand. Now, you think about it, it's t however small a lady is, you can't actually raise a lady up just by a hand unless you really tug <laughs> and pull, and I can't see Jesus doing that. In other words, uh, Peter's mother-in-law, even though she had a high temperature and was feeling dreadful, she probably had a fast pulse and she was probably probably perspiring a lot and everything else. Um, she actually had to help in this. She actually, you can't raise a lady up just uh, from horizontal to vertical just by raising on her hand. No, the, this lady had to help. She had to, even though she was in a weakened state, she had to basically stand up. Now, this is actually very consistent with other occasions when, uh, pe when Jesus heals people. For example, he said to the man with a withered hand, stretch out your hand. And as the hand was stretched out, so the hand was healed. Uh, he said to somebody else who was a cripple, he said, take up your mat and walk. And in the Old Testament, uh, Elisha said to Naaman, who, was, who had leprosy, go and uh, bathe in the River Jordan seven times and then you'll be healed. In each occasion, the sick person had to do something. And on this occasion, Peter's mother-in-law had to do something as an act of faith. Now, I find that very, very interesting. I don't know what you think about that. It is. It's so interesting, Richard. It's... Um it really is a way of us um, almost demonstrating to Jesus. It's it's um, it's an expression of our belief, actually. It's um, it's an act that shows we're placing confidence in His ability to to do something in, in yeah. our lives. It's yeah. it's a response from us to yeah. Yeah. to His power. So yeah. it, it's really interesting that you picked up on that in different examples throughout the scriptures. That there was yeah. always that miracle that happened, but also a response from the person receiving yeah. the yeah. answer to prayer. Yes. Um, the other thing that I was really hoping to pick up on too was actually just in this account you have perhaps Simon Peter or his wife who literally just asked Jesus um, it, um, it, it's so simple but they didn't have to kind of go through any kind of any 
rites or rituals, they simply went to Jesus with a need and they asked him and Jesus remedied or answered that need. And I just thought it's so simple, but it, it might be really helpful to kind of highlight that um, in whatever circumstance or need that we're facing, we actually can go before Jesus in prayer and simply ask him. Um, it doesn't depend on our goodness. It doesn't depend on us doing anything. We are actually just able to go before Jesus, even today with any need that we have in any area of our lives and simply ask him in prayer to, to meet that need. If it, and if it is for healing, to ask for healing, a miracle of healing in our lives. And in this mm. account, we see him answer in a profound mm. and miraculous way. It's mm. so simple, but it, it, sometimes these things can be lost on us. Oh, yeah. There was one yeah. more little point that I, I, I'd like to make is that if you read the gospel account carefully, the Mark's gospel, the fever didn't actually leave Peter's mother-in-law until she had stood up. That's a remarkable wow, thing. That, she yeah. stood up with a fever, and it says after she stood up, then the fever left. Now, isn't that remarkable? Um, <laughs> um, you know, uh, the fever was a problem, but the, she had to do something. She had to stand up, even though she had a fever, uh, which is not easy to do because you feel dizzy and faint and everything else. But the fever didn't leave until she had standing. Amazing. Yeah. And then towards the end of this passage, um, perhaps you could talk us through this, Richard, because it describes the way that there were many other needs that Jesus was confronted with outside Simon Peter's yeah. home. Um, yeah. I think actually the whole city gathered, and yeah. there were many um, requests yeah. and needs of healing. Yes. And the account describes what Jesus did, his compassion in that situation. Are you able to touch on that? Um, well, yes, yeah, probably not as well as you, actually, but I'll, I'll start and you can carry on. How about that? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's interesting just to start with um, that they, um, first of all, the news would have spread around uh, Capernaum instantly, you know. <laughs> Everyone would have known about this. But it's interesting that they didn't come till the evening, till the end of the Sabbath. Right. Um, I don't know, but of course we know from other parts of the New Testament that the, uh, the scribes and the Pharisees disapproved of healing on the Sabbath because they thought this was work. They interpreted it as work, which is absolutely ridiculous. In fact, Jesus elsewhere actually went out of his way to heal on the Sabbath. But we won't go down there. But they didn't want to upset the scribes and the Pharisees. So they were desperate to come to Peter's house and be healed, but they waited till six o'clock till the sun went down till the end of the Sabbath before they came. And then when they came, the, the sick and the demon possessed, Jesus healed them. Over to you, Birgit. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think the thing that just really struck me with those concluding lines of this passage is just that, that Jesus had such compassion um, over the needs of people that he didn't just come to to teach and to, to share the good news, but also to relieve suffering, the suffering that he was confronted with. And as I mentioned at the beginning, all forms of suffering, whether um, there are instances of demonic oppression and Jesus yes. was able to bring delivering, deliverance, yeah. so yeah. in a supernatural context. Um, I mean, death is even subject to Jesus, as we will find out later as we go yeah. through this miracle series yeah. where yeah. he was able to raise Lazarus from the dead. Sure. But in this instance, we have an, another example of a very particular need of, of physical healing and we see Jesus' compassion and power demonstrated in this and then he extends that same compassion um, to all those who came mm. to him and, and requested mm. healing. It's it's amazing actually what yeah. the life of Jesus, the miracles that he performed. Yeah. But I guess the, the really interesting thing for us to do now is actually to, to bridge this with, with our setting and our context and um, this is where we have something that we hope will be a, a real encouragement um, to you watching and that is that um, a few years ago, I did an interview with um, a, a street pastor. His name is Gary Flynn. It's an amazing testimony. It was on a program called Cross and Light. And this um, testimony came to mind because Gary, at a certain point in his life, before he became a Christian actually, was diagnosed with bowel cancer. He had a number of very, very difficult things happen in his life, which he goes into in his testimony. But he was diagnosed with bowel cancer and then he describes the process of becoming a Christian, which was through a, the influence of a friend and then doing the Alpha course and going away on the Holy Spirit weekend and just his encounter with God through those experiences. So, um, after he had um, this 
the conversion experience of coming to God, he then has this amazing experience when he was staying at his grandmother's home where he had an encounter with Jesus in his room. And although he was going through chemotherapy at the time and he continued with that treatment, he had this experience of healing, which he believes was the point at which he was fully healed of bowel cancer. So we just wanted to take a couple of excerpts from that testimony um, just before he becomes a Christian, just to set the, the scene about what his life was like and his diagnosis, and then this encounter that he had with Jesus and the healing that he received. So we're just going to go to that testimony now and we'll be back with you afterwards. Um, I bought a, a massive place in the country, um, something that everybody dreams of, swimming pool, hot tub, yes. you know, land, that kind of stuff. Yeah. And I think in my mind, the bigger my business got, the more money I got, maybe I'd find that happiness and my, the emptiness that was in there. Yeah. Wasn't the case. Uh, it was around three years ago, July, my grandfather come over. Mm. We'd been out for a meal. We sat down round by the swimming pool. And uh, he sat there and he said, oh, son, he said, he said, um, he said, I'm so proud of you. He said, uh, you, you know, you've had a bit of a rough life. You, you've never had nothing given to you as such. And you've done all this, you know, you, you're amazing. You must be really happy. And I paused for a minute and it just come out and it, I just said, happy. I said, I hate my life. I hate me. What's all this about, this house? What's next, a bigger house? If I owned the county, the, if I owned the, the world, I still wouldn't be happy. I can't take much more. And then prior to that, I'd had a few tummy problems having tests done at the hospital. A week after making that statement, I, um, I went to a hospital and I was taken into a room and there was two people in there which always makes you think, it could be bad news here. Yeah, yeah. And um, I was told I had, uh, I was told I had bowel cancer. And this rush that hit me, um, I just ripped my clothes off, just like, you know, like a panic. Yeah. Although I wasn't happy, I didn't probably really want to die. No. Um, I asked the doctor, got down my knees, he said, doctor, don't let me die. He said, listen, it's, you know, bowel cancer's quite good if it's caught early, you know. Mm. And they started to do a diagram of what it was, and I just went, I don't want to know. I left the house, uh, left the hospital, went to Sainsbury's, told my children first. Mm. Um, that was a big point for me. Um, my eldest, you know, I told Tony, um, it's quite good and quite calm. I told my youngest, Jimmy, and didn't cry. And it was time to walk out, I was time to walk out, my youngest son said, Dad. And uh, I turned around, he said, Dad, he said, um, you ain't gonna die, are you? I never forget that, never forget that. I said to him, um, I can't tell you that. It's not in my hands. Um, I'll do everything I can not to. You know what I mean? I don't mm. want to leave you. And that was a big point. And I went from there for a, to a supermarket, bought myself a bottle of Jamaican Spice yeah. Rum and, and, and drank that and got drunk to numb the feeling. The day after, still quite numb, but the day after that, I looked to the sky and I didn't know about God or anything. And I went, listen, if you want me, you've got to fight in your hands because I don't want to go. And I ain't going nowhere. I don't want to leave my children. Because um, I knew what it was like not having a dad. Yeah. So. It's interesting though, you know, Gary, because you're just saying that, that you didn't know God at that point, no. but it's like at this point, God, God was pursuing you, <laughs> you know, because he actually had a, a plan in the situation. And this is where things really started to change in your life. Something I need to tell you, four months into my, uh, into my journey as a Christian, um, I stayed at my grandparents' house. Yeah. I haven't stayed at, my at the grandparents' house since my nan died. Reason being is she wasn't there and I used to get upset that she wasn't sat in her chair and that kind of stuff. Well that evening my granddad said, Can you stay the night? I said, I don't want to scrand it. I, he said, please come and stay. So Joanne said to me, you know, to stay the night. So we stayed the night. Um, I remember middle of the night, I woke up like that, sat bolt upright and wide awake. And there was a beam of light coming into my tummy. Amazing. Thank you, Lord. And it felt like someone's hand was in my tummy, moving around. And I know I wasn't dreaming, because you can't feel nothing in a dream. You fall off a cliff, you wake up. It felt like someone's hand was in my tummy, this light was moving around. And I was like that. And then I looked at the right-hand side of my bed, and all I perceived to be was Jesus, yeah. who stood there like that. And even now, just it really uh, takes my breath. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. I, um... I just, I knew I was awake. I looked at Joanne that was asleep. I laid down and I just thought, you must be dreaming. You must be dreaming. But I knew I was awake and I closed my eyes and I left it for, a, say, 10, 15 seconds. I think, when you open your eyes, he's going to be gone. And I went like that and he was still there. And that, for me, was, I think, the day I was healed. 
I'm not silly enough to think that the chemo wasn't doing nothing, but Jesus healed me that day. And I'm one that needs proof. I've never asked for proof of God, because yeah. I know that's not the right thing to do. But obviously he knows us. Yes. And that's what happened. I kind of think my grandmother went to Jesus and said, do us a favour, come and see my <laughs> son and sort him out. You know? Gary, <laughs> we only have two minutes left, but I have to ask you this. When you had the manifest presence of Jesus in the room next to you, what was that like? What was Jesus' presence like? Oh, absolutely amazing. From my toes to my head, um, I always associate when I feel his presence or see his presence. It's like, I'm imagine I'm a big block of ice and then I'm just being hit with a blowtorch. I just kind of just melt in his presence. It's amazing. You know, absolutely melt in his presence. And that peace and that joy that you were looking for as a young man when you were suicidal, you had all of that devastation. Yeah, that emptiness from inside yeah. was there through that. And I've had it since, you know. What an amazing testimony of Jesus appearing in the room with Gary and bringing this healing and restoration to his life. And in the same way that we saw in this gospel account of Jesus healing Simon Peter's mother-in-law, Jesus still heals today. We hope it's been an encouragement to you. Richie, thank you so much for taking part in the program with me as always. Um, God bless you. See you next time. Bye-bye.